In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he placed the stars, and he, he put animals and plants and trees and uh, the rivers, everything that he put together, including he created man and created woman, Adam and Eve, and placed them in the garden with this heart desire to have intimate, deep relationship with his creation. And he gave them everything for their disposal. Everything was for them. And he said, there's only one thing. He said, there's this tree and I just can't let you eat that tree. So everything is for you except for that tree. And, and if you know the story in the book of Genesis, Adam and Eve, eventually, they do eat of this tree. They eat the fruit. And of course, uh, sin enters the world. They, they chose to disobey God. And in that moment, before God removes them from the Garden of Eden, this perfect existence, and cast them out into the world to have to now struggle in childbirth and labor. He says, he says something important to Eve. He says, look, there's going to be some problems. One is that you and snakes are probably not, well, you're not going to get along anymore. And that maybe is true for you men as well. You and snakes are not going to be friendly. And secondly, he says, but through you, through you, Eve and Adam, through you will come a promised redeemer, one that will eventually recalibrate uh, everything back to the way it was supposed to be, the way I originally designed. And of course, time moved on as you read through the book of Genesis and the world began to be populated and, and God looks down and he says, it's just evil though. Like the hearts of man is just evil continually. And he goes to Noah and, and he eventually gets Noah and his family and Noah builds an ark and God floods the world and he destroys his creation and um, the humanity that was there, and all that's left is one family. But he, he comes to Noah and he says, today I promise to you that I'm going to continue the promise I had with Eve, that through you, through the offspring coming, I will not destroy this world again by flood. In fact, I will place this bow, the rainbow, as a, as a covenant between you and me that every time it rains and the sun shines just right, that covenant will say, I will never destroy again because my promise to Eve will continue. A redeemer will come. Time progresses forward and the populations begin to grow again. And then there's this gentleman by the name of Abram, and God renames his name Abraham, and he makes a promise to Abraham. He says, Abraham, you're the chosen one. I've, you have found favor in my eyes, and through you, all of the, through, excuse me, through your offspring, all of the nations on the earth will be blessed because you've obeyed me. In other words, Abraham, the promised Redeemer will come through you. Through your family lineage, eventually the Messiah, the Redeemer, will arrive. And today we end, in the, or end up now in the book of Ruth where we've been walking. This is a couple of generations later after Abraham. God is continuing to work his promises because he is a promise-making and a promise-keeping God. And Ruth and Naomi and Boaz are a part of God's story to see that promised Redeemer come. I called this today uh, the message, I promise. You see, our God is a promise-making, promise-keeping God, and he has not stopped, and he will not stop until he has fulfilled everything he has promised. And I wonder, have you ever made a promise? Have you ever looked to somebody and said, I promise I'll never do this again, or I promise I will do this? Or maybe you've made promises to God and, and only to find that it was difficult to keep your promise. See, our human nature, it's difficult to hold those promises, but God is faithful. I remember back in 1994, I made a promise to my wife, Jennifer, and I'm so grateful. She's made it easy to keep that promise, <laughs> but I made a promise. I stood in front of witnesses and in front of, of the, the ceremony to say, I do, I promise, I promise to, to keep my love for you, to be faithful to you. And in our story today of Ruth, we're going to continue to look at different promises that are made. And we're going to look at it from two lenses. We have the promise of God's story, and then the individual promises we'll see Ruth and Boaz making through a story today. And if you haven't been with us for the last two messages, I encourage you to go watch those because I don't have time to recap everything. But here we are in the book of Ruth. 
And we have two important characters we're starting with, and this is Ruth and Naomi. And of course, the story goes that they left the the area of Bethlehem and they went to Moab and eventually Naomi's husband dies and her two sons die. And they've got Ruth, the daughter-in-law, who says to Naomi, I'll stand by your side. She says, where you go, I will go. I will care for you, Naomi. You're my mother-in-law. And she says, and your God will be my God. Remember, this is of a pagan culture. We're not worshiping God. They were worshiping idols and all kinds of problems. Well, they left, they arrive in Bethlehem, and now we're caught up a little bit into our story because Ruth had been out and she had been gleaning and capturing great food and was blessed by a man named Boaz. In fact, in the story we had, Jason talked about how Boaz says, look, God has found favor on you and he's placed his wings over you like an eagle, brings you underneath his wings and he is giving you a, a place to take refuge. So our story today, we're down the road a little bit now. And, uh, Ruth and Naomi have been living in this area now. They've been receiving the benefit of this gleaning process of, of going in the fields and collecting the leftovers after the harvesters. And of course, Boaz has blessed them with tremendous amounts. But see, we reach this moment when Naomi looks at Ruth, and, and this is what she says in chapter three, if you want to keep up. She says, my daughter, I must find a home for you where you, where you will be well provided for. There's this moment where she says, look, you're young. You still have potential to be remarried, to have children. I'm old. I'm, I'm out of those years. But it's time for you to move on. You've been very gracious to me, but it's time to find you a place. And so she says, you remember that guy, Boaz? Well, he is one of our redeemers. And there's been a conversation about that, that ultimately through the, the way the land was, was given to the Israelites and the way the land was allowed to be passed from family to family, Boaz was part of the family who could redeem this family and keep the name attached to the land. And so Naomi looks to Ruth and says, here's what you're going to do. I want you to get yourself all prettied up. So clean your hair, wash your face, put on clean clothes, put on some perfume, and I want you to go and I want you to find Boaz. But there's a specific way that I want you to do that. You see, Boaz is out at the threshing floor. So it's the barley harvest is happening and they're going to toss up these these barley grains and the chaff, the, the outer shell that's not worth anything gets blown away in the wind and they collect all of the, the plentiful grain, the good food. And he's going to be dirty, and he's going to be dusty, and he's probably going to be hot and sweaty and stinky, and he's going to be tired. But he's also going to go find a place to rest, to watch over his harvest. And so go find him where he rests. And when you find him sleeping, let him get to sleep. He'll be full, he'll have a nice meal, and he'll be tired. But what I want you to do is then to go lay at his feet. And so when we get into the story, when I first, like, was reading Naomi's story and this whole book of Ruth, I was kind of confused about it. Honestly, I came into this sermon series going, what are we going to teach about? Is this like we're going to teach how to romance, how to, how to find your suitor, your mate? I was like, that's going to be really uncomfortable. In fact, the first time I read the story, I thought it was a really weird story. I'm like, what in the world? Are they just trying to manipulate some guy? Because that's what it felt like. Hey, let's figure out how to take advantage of the wealthy guy. But the more I've studied, the more we've listened, the more I've looked, I realize this is an incredible story. I think it's a lot less about love and and much more about commitment. It's a much bigger picture of not only our promise-keeping God, but the promise-keeping people who said, this is our God and we follow him. So we see Boaz, who's committed to following God. And, And his character, we see that over and over again. We've talked about like a picture of Jesus that Boaz fulfills a redeemer position very much like our Savior Jesus does. And we see how he interacts and he blesses this family. But listen to what happens in the story because she goes in, Ruth goes in and she lays at his feet. And what she does, she uncovers his feet. And, And it's interesting if you think about his feet probably didn't smell great. She's prettied up, so her perfume is gonna definitely be noticeable. 
If you've ever been into a place where it's sweaty and then you go into a place that smells nice, that aroma is going to be, be around. But she uncovers his feet. And if you've ever had your feet uncovered, eventually you wake up, right? You wake up because you go, wow, it's kind of cold. And why are my feet uncovered? Well, it says in, in uh, verse 8, he says, in the middle of the night, something startled the man and he turned and there was a woman lying at his feet. So remember, he's protecting his crop a little bit. And then, whoa, who is this? It's dark. Who is at my feet? And listen to Naomi's response. I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you're my guardian redeemer of our family. She says, take the corner of your garment and put it over me. Now, this is not a prescription for how to propose to somebody. It's just descriptive of how in this culture, this was very natural and normal. And there's two things we want to see about this. One, she lays at his feet like a servant. And, and I'm not that familiar. The culture is very different than ours. But from what I understand in reading, the culture says, look, servants lay at their master's feet so they can be at the beck and call for whatever their needs are. And so she lays at his feet in humility. And two, she says, look, put your garment over me. In other words, I would like you to be my husband. This is a proposal opportunity. And I think in this moment, what we realize is there's a promise of protection. Put your garment over me, just like we read about earlier, where the, that says your wing is, God's wing is over you, and it's providing for you protection and, and favor has been found. And so she uses that, that imagery as well in this culture to put the garment over me and be my protector. You see, this is also symbolic of what Jesus does for us, that he provides us spiritual protection. He says, when you come to me humbly, if you come before me, I will give you spiritual protection. I will protect your heart. I will protect your eternity. And I'll be a place of provision for you where you can find rest. And we see this picture and this paralleling of Boaz and how he responds and Ruth and her response. But I want you to realize this is really a critical moment because she's kind of put herself out on the limb. You see, she has the right to go and assume this position to say, you know what? You are a redeemer and I have a right as part of the lineage of this family to seek that you would redeem me and redeem the land with me. But she does it in humility. But I want you to hear his response because I think his response helps echo God's heart. He says this, the Lord bless you, my daughter. He replied, the kindness, this kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. In other words, the kindness that you were showing to your mother-in-law to care for her, to watch over her, to leave in the land of Moab, to follow her, to say, I will follow your God, that your God will be my God. He says this, this kindness right now, your willingness to submit here and surrender as a servant to me is greater than I could imagine. And then he says this, you've not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. You see, so obviously you would say, clearly Boaz is an older individual. And he says, you didn't go after someone younger. You didn't look at wealth or lack of wealth. You came to me because, and I think the bigger picture is, you know that the best way to care for your mother-in-law, to be committed to this God, is to go and assume the position of joining a Redeemer to continue this family lineage. Man, talk about commitment. And he says this then, he says, now my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do what you ask. In other words, he says, man, I am, I am blown away that you would come to me, that there were other choices out there, that you would come to me and say, please be my redeemer. Isn't that just like our Lord who just says, I wait for you. And all I ask is you come to me and just humbly, just ask. And I can't wait to redeem you. And I'm, I'm excited that you would be a part of this. The story goes on, though, and it's amazing to me with the next steps of this, because basically the promise comes. He says, 
He says, listen, stay the night. He says, but there's a problem. See, there's another redeemer out there. There's, there's somebody that's ahead of me. Look at the character of Boaz. He's got the woman there. He's, she's basically said, please, will you marry me? And he's taken back by how amazing this is. But he says, oh, but there's something else. I can't do it in a way that would be wrong. I have to follow the traditions. I have to go. There's another redeemer. But he says this. He says, stay the night and rest. He says this though. But if he is not willing to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until morning. In other words, we've got some work to do here. I'm going to be committed, but I promise to you, I promise you, I will seek to make this right. And I will go first to the, the, the first redeemer in line. But what he ultimately says here is, look, I promise redemption. And, and Jesus, like Boaz, you know, he promises us redemption. When I started our story today, as I started in, God has been working from the moment in the Garden of Eden through Abraham, now into Ruth and Boaz to say, my Redeemer is coming, I promise. And Jesus says, if you come to me, I promise I will redeem you. I will take care of your past. I will take care of your sin. It was paid for with my blood. I promise to redeem you. Well, our story continues. And uh, so she stays the night. And then Boaz, he says, look, I want you to get up early enough that you can go ahead and leave before people can recognize you. Not because we've done anything inappropriate, but let's not do anything that tarnishes what we're going to do here today. And so he loads her up with grain, sends her home to Naomi. And uh, Naomi's like, wow, look at all this food again. This is cool. But of course she says, so how did it go, right? How'd it go last night? Like, what did he say? And of course, Naomi, I'm sure is giddy. Well, he said he would redeem me. But then she says, yeah, but there's one thing. There's some other redeemer out there. And Naomi, of course, just goes, just be still, right? Be still, my child. It's okay. Because he has made a promise to you and he will make sure before the day is over that it is resolved. And we get into chapter four. And in chapter four, we see the, the conversation begins to happen. And so what happens is that Boaz goes to the city and there's the main gate where oftentimes the key leaders of the community would gather. And so he goes there looking for the redeemer who's first in line. And he finds him and he says, uh, hey, come on over and sit down. I need to have a conversation with you. And then he grabs all the elders, gets 10 elders, brings them together. So now you've got your witnesses together. Nothing's going to be done in secret. And he says, um, here's the deal. That uh, Naomi's back and her land is for sale. And uh, you are the first uh, redeemer. I am second in line. And I would like to offer you the opportunity because she's ready. And we need to take care of this um, because her family lineage needs to continue. And of course, this first guy, he kind of looks at us like, great, more property, fantastic. Yeah, you bet I'll redeem it, no problem. And then Boaz goes, oh, but there's a catch. There's one more piece. Um, the Moabite girl, Ruth, you have to redeem her as well. In other words, you need to make her your wife. And at some point, children have to come into the equation so that we can continue. And of course, that's a bit of a deal breaker because this redeemer is married already. And that might be an awkward moment. Hey, honey, I got some new land and uh, this is my new wife. So he, of course, says, oh, I can't do that. That would ruin my inheritance. I've got boys already. I've already got things going. So he releases it and he says, it's okay. You can just, you can have it. And so there's this exchange that happens, in fact, um, and, and it involves, thankfully, if this wasn't a shameful exchange, because basically, I guess in this time, the guy would have taken off his sandal, the one who said, no, I won't be able to redeem you. And the woman who would be standing there would spit in his face. It was kind of a disgraceful thing. What do you mean you won't redeem me? <laughs> Spits in his face. But in this case, this wasn't a shady deal. He wasn't rejecting her out of something inappropriate. He just said, I'm already married. I've already got an inheritance. And so he then extends the right of redemption to Boaz. So Boaz, of course, he receives, he receives the sandal from this guy as proof that this transaction is done. I don't know how long he carried it around. I'll put it in his pocket, wore it as a necklace. I don't, know what, I don't know where they went from there. But it's this interesting exchange in the culture where they said, yeah, this, this is important. 
And so maybe the guy has to walk around limping for a while and then his feet hurt to remind himself, oh yeah, I did give it up. Oh yeah, I forgot. All right, but anyways, I'm assuming eventually he gets a new pair of shoes. Um, but that's part of the exchange process. But I want to take you to a really important statement that happens because we've talked about how Ruth, she comes in, she's done everything that she felt was the best way to approach it based on the advice of her mother-in-law. And Boaz responded, and, and we get to this last really important piece, the promise of identity. He says, as he stands up, Boaz, in this exchange of a sandal, he says this, I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite. So not only have I acquired Naomi's land and all that goes with her, but I have acquired Ruth the Moabite, Malon's widow, as my wife in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from his hometown. Today, you are witnesses. In other words, I'm taking Naomi, excuse me, I'm taking Ruth. She was the Moabite, but today she has a new identity and she will be my wife. And I think about in the parallel of Christ, when he says, your past is gone. The name you came with of sinner, of drunken, of a thief, whatever the baggage was that you came with today, you have a new identity, a child of God, redeemed and no longer associated with your past. This is now a move forward for you. Have you made that, I wonder, have you gone to the feet of Jesus and said, please, help me erase my past. Would you redeem me out of that? And Jesus is waiting to say, yes, I want to be your redeemer. But back to our story, because I, I think this important moment, I wonder what it was like for Ruth. In fact, I didn't get to read it, but basically, Ruth was seen as a very upstanding person. Um, in fact, here's what it says. It says this. It says that all the people of the town knew or know, excuse me, you're a woman of noble character. Wasn't that cool that, that her witness in the community was, was a response? People saw who she was and they talked about how she loved, apparently, I would say loved God, loved her mother-in-law, was honest, was hardworking and of noble character. And you see, this story isn't just a story. It's not just some small piece in a big book. It's a critical piece. And I want to read to you, if you want to open your Bibles up, on the last part of chapter 4. I want to read what happens, because what happens is that they get married. And they have a child. But listen to what happens with this child. This is, this is an important piece of our story today. It says this, Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. So one, Ruth hands this child to her mother-in-law. And in some way, this is like her child. And, and she, she grabs this child and she cares for this child as if it were her own. And her family line will continue with this new baby. And this new baby's name is Obed. And it says the woman living, living there said, Naomi has a son. So redemption came with Ruth, but Naomi was a recipient of that redemption as well. And they named him Obed, and he was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now you might ask the question, so what's the big deal? Who's David? So I want to take you and finish up here. I want to take you to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, we're now in the New Testament. Many years have passed. Many years have passed. And here's the opening statement. It says, this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. In other words, Abraham, through Abraham came Isaac and then Jacob and down the line until you get to verse five, Matthew one. And then Salmon had the father Boaz. I like Salmon, whose name was Rahab. And Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. You see, God's promise that started in the Garden of Eden continues through Ruth and, and Boaz as they give offspring that eventually leads to King David. Remember David and Goliath? This is the guy that chucks the rocks at the big giant. 
This is King David. And through him, eventually, if you read the rest of Matthew 1, comes Jesus. You see, our promise-keeping, promise-making God did not stop at Ruth. And if you go back and take the time to read the stories of many of the people involved here, it was Jews and Gentiles. It was prostitutes and people of noble character. And God said, I want all kinds of people. And he brought them in through Christ. And Jesus, the Messiah, came to redeem you and to redeem me. And I I love this story. The more I look at it, the less I see necessarily a love story, although I think that's a big piece. But the more I see is a God who's committed. He's committed to you and to me to ensure that each one of us has an opportunity to hear about the Messiah, to hear of Jesus and and surrender to him to say, look, Jesus wasn't just a one-time show-up guy. I've been planning this since before creation began. And for those that have been redeemed by him, he will return again. I've proven my commitment to you through through the ages, and I'm proving to you today, you can trust me. I'm a God that you can trust. I hope that as you hear the story of Ruth and Boaz today, that you're taken, take a moment and ask yourself, am I that committed? Am I that committed to Jesus that that I would maybe leave areas like Ruth did, areas of my life, parts of my life that aren't good, to pursue God and be committed to him? I think one of the key things I want you to leave with today is because we can trust God, because he makes promises and keeps them, I think it should give our souls rest when things don't look like they're going the way they should. And so I just encourage you today, just rest. Rest and know that God is with you. That God is a promise-making, promise-keeping God who desires to see you not only find peace in him, but to find ways to help others find that peace. Our Redeemer lives. Our Redeemer lives. Thank you guys for joining me. I'm going to hand off to our uh, campuses. And if you're online, I'll join you here as well. Well, thank you for sticking around. I hope that uh, as we've walked through the story of Ruth, it, it's really captured your heart, really, for not just the story of a couple, but of a bigger picture of God, that, that walk through the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. You see God working through his people. He calls people, he uses them, he works through them. And one of our challenges is really, how are we going to be people who are making, <laughs> excuse me, people who are helping people find and follow Jesus? How do we do that? It's a question that always comes up. And so we're going to challenge you through a strategy called bless. And for some of you, you're going to go, oh man, they're doing this again in about three weeks. You're going to say, you're still doing this. I'm going to say, this is a a difficult part of what it takes to begin to make disciples. And it starts with prayer. So I'm going to ask you to do something. Pause it if you can. Take a second in your campus, if that's where you're listening to, and I want you to grab your phone. I want you to open the calendar, and whenever you time you wake up and you have a few minutes, I want you to write, remind, write a reminder. Pray that God would provide opportunities for you to share the gospel in your community. Pray that God would provide opportunities for you to share the gospel in your community. You see, we have to start to open our eyes to what God wants to do. And so we're going to be challenging you for the next several weeks to begin with prayer every day. God, would you bring an opportunity today? And I believe as you begin to ask that prayer, God will provide opportunities. In fact, I think he's been providing them all along, but this is going to help get you more in tune with the work that God wants to do. And we'll work to fill in the rest of the letters in the weeks to come. But let's start with prayer. Let's begin there. Let me pray for you. Father God, thank you so much for this amazing story of Ruth, God, that that we see a woman who comes out of a difficult uh, life, a difficult area of life, a place where she was more or less banished from God, and yet she comes to believe in you, to trust you, and you bless her, and then you use her to carry the name eventually to bring Jesus into our world. We thank you, God, for your love for us and your commitment. I pray that you would provide opportunities for us to share your gospel in the communities we live in. 
It's in your name we pray. Amen. Love you guys.